morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Isabel Paradis. I'm president of Hot Telecom, and I will mo be moderating our next panel, during which we will discuss the cloudification of the wholesale business. So did you know that by 2025, over 75% of enterprise data is expected to be processed in the cloud? That's true, an amazing number. And as the cloud evolution continues to accelerate, it is also reshaping the wholesale industry as we know it. So today we will discuss with a panel of wholesale superstars this massive shift as we'll be diving into the opportunities, the challenges, the game-changing strategies wholesale businesses must consider in this more and more cloud-centric world. So are you ready, I hope, to talk about the future? I would like to start by inv uh, inviting my uh, panelists to the hot seat, to the stage. Uh, please help me welcome Alan Quayle. He's the owner uh, of Alan Quayle Business Service Development. Amid Jamus is founder of Telecoms Exchange. Andreas Hip is the CEO of Catalia. And Enkit Agarwal is the founder and CEO of TelQ Global. Well, welcome, gentlemen, to the hot seat. I think you're all over the world. I've got some people in the, in the US. I've got some people in Singapore, some people in Asia. Welcome to the hot seat, people. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Isabel. Hello. Are you ready, guys? Andreas, are you still sure. awake? Sure. <laughs> only 8 30 come on oh, 45. all right oh, okay okay right. it's morning for you so guys uh i like to start with the beginning on all my panels and i'll start with the start and i think in our case the start is by defining defining what cloudification means for wholesalers cloud means something for enterprises but it means something completely different i'm sure at least quite different for wholesalers so i mean you know what Let's let, get us started. What does wholesale cloudification mean? What does it look like? Hi, Isabel. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so uh, basically the cloudification of telecom wholesale basically involves uh, migrating large-scale telecom operations and services to the cloud for better scalability, flexibility, and uh, hopefully cost savings. Okay. Anyone? Uh, that's a very short and to the point of answer. I mean, I'm impressed. <laughs> Anyone wants to add to this? I'm sure, Andreas, you want to add something to this? Yeah, I think it, uh, Amit uh, defined it very well. But uh, in simple terms, it's really just running applications that were previously run on on-premise hardware servers in data centers, largely owned or at least operated by the carrier. Uh, in public or private cloud environments, which, uh, as Amit pointed out, allows more scalability, you know, less work for you to look after the infrastructure and connectivity. And uh, that certainly also when it comes to redundancy and so on has, has quite a you know, couple of advantages, but uh, um, I think we talk about the other side of that mm. as well later. Mm. And Alan, I'm going to put you on the spot. Sorry, right away. Sorry about that. No problem. What, the, what is what is cloudification of wholesale not? What it is? What is it not? Oh, wow. It is a marketing term. So uh, as, 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 as it's a marketing term, it can be used in a whole host of ways. Um, I think that yeah, the key is we're in the midst of a transition from running on your old data centers to for certain workloads, migrating that over to a cloud provider. Now, of course, that's the extremes. You can run your own cloud as well. And we see some wholesale providers are doing that because of regulations that require them to keep the data within their uh, country of operation. So this is a complex space that has a country uh, element to it, also the types of business, and most importantly, the workloads. So for example, analytics, very important to all wholesale providers. and with analytics that can use a lot of uh, processing power. But there you see some uh, wholesale providers using uh, serverless. So they've got some an analysis they want to do, fire it off onto Amazon, fire up a whole host of uh, servers, get the results out within minutes rather than churning for days through uh, your uh, uh, existing data set. So there's one example around uh, analytics, that you've got a good case for cloudifying that piece. While the other, and I'm gonna say this many times, it's all around people, process, and technology. So in that move, your purchasing processes have a big impact 
on how fast you can move. So we've seen with some telcos, just you know, that transition to like containerization has been quite difficult. Purchasing department may not even allow you to purchase your uh, dynamic. It's like how many servers are we, you know, sort of uh, buying, uh, and you know, let's purchase on peak because that's the way we've always done it. So we don't have to do this sort of dynamic. So even within something as simple as transitioning an existing workload out, you have to put through a different purchase department. That can slow that transition down. Hence, what we've seen in some cases, cloudification being having a partner that already is running in the cloud, that has a very dynamic uh, solution uh, so that they can deal with all those purchase contracts of cloud resources and deliver a very efficient hosted service for the telco. So again, many different models uh, that we're seeing in this simple term, which is cloudification. Mm -hmm. So for the people out there in the wholesale business and asking themselves, should I cloudify or not cloudify? That is the question. Who should cloudify and not cloudify? I guess it's not everyone. It's not across the board. I don't know, Ankit, do you have a view on that? Who should, you know, who should start thinking, yes, I should cloudify my, my wholesale business and it is for me. And who should say, no, it's not for me. I should not cloudify. And Kit, are you there? Yes. So um, <clears throat> I think, Isabel, that depends on company to company and uh, what services they're offering because uh, uh, it, it is purely, uh, you know, their perspective as to which uh, process or which service they may want to clarify and which they may not want to. For example, you know, they may be restricted by their... Um, uh, regulatory norms or uh, uh, legal norms as to not, uh, you know, host personal data information or other things in a third country. Um, but for companies that are not restricted by any such uh, uh, conditions, uh, they should definitely go for cloudification. Um, more so, it also depends on how exactly they're doing it. Uh, like, uh, you know, for example, uh, we, we are a phone numbers company and uh, as against a voice or a SMS rate, wherein you just put up the rate and, you know, uh, the customer is ready to send you traffic and things like that. The phone numbers come with a lot of information attached to them. Um, how many channels are there? Is, is, uh, are there any service restrictions? Uh, does the customer uh, need end user documents and things like that? So if, uh, you know, all these things are being done offline via email or any other thing, then you don't call it cloudification. So all these things should be up on the cloud, um, meaning the entire, you know, value chain or the process should be up on the cloud um, to actually, uh, you know, uh, provide automation and cloudification to your end user. Okay. Andreas, you sell cloudification services and non-cloudification mm. services. So when you talk to your customers, what do you see? Who who do you think should cloudify or wants to and who doesn't want to or shouldn't? Okay, so as Ankit said, right, it, it's very much depends a bit on the nature of uh, the operation. And uh, the, the obvious reasons for doing it uh, are two, really. Uh, one is operational efficiency and scaling, right? So rapid expansion, you don't need to ship hardware to some faraway data center in some faraway country, you just have an Azure or AWS and there's many other cloud providers uh, account and then you spin up the virtual machine and deploy your software in kind of hours or days, right? So that's the beauty of it, obviously. And you don't have to worry about hardware support and of life spare parts, Every, all the greed you usually have and which takes a lot of manpower to support. And especially if you don't have a global operation, you usually wouldn't have people on site. So you always rely on third parties to actually deal with that. Um, the second one is uh, obviously also if you have a very volatile or fluctuating traffic profile or usage profile, um, you know, you always have to dimension your own network at the highest level. So you can always deal with a peak. You can always deal with a Christmas holiday or an Eid or something where traffic just is 50% higher or something. Um, the second one is uh, that finally we get into some sort of digitalization, also not just in enterprise, 
there, you know, as Ankit also said, you know, run applications. Right? You don't want to send emails with number information and attachments of password copies of who the actual user is, right? You want to have an online portal. So the portal resides also in the cloud where it can be accessed from anywhere and is easily accessible. And um, and when it comes to hosted PDX or UCAS or CCAS platforms, they also sit in the cloud, right? So you want to have your infrastructure where possible in the cloud, right? But there are restrictions. So depending on the business you're in uh, and also in the country you're from, there's regulatory restrictions, there's data protection concerns. Uh, other things are also, uh, if you have a lot of volume, a lot of media going through a cloud infrastructure, the cost can be quite significant, right? So because you pay per download, right? So if a lot of media or streaming going through that, uh, you better calculate this before you sign up with any of the public cloud providers. So it's, um, yeah, it depends. But uh, I think there is no clear yes and no clear no. I think there is anything in between <laughs> the extremes <laughs> or a hybrid of it. <laughs> uh, so, so Amid and, and Alan, do you agree? Do you see the same thing or do you see something different? I think actually Ankit raised a very important point that there's an initial condition around the automation of your processes. That simply needs to be in software because uh, without that in software, then you know, if you've got all these you know, sort of uh, legacy processes, that's going to nullify any impact of moving through to somebody's data center that you're running or through to a full cloud offer. So I think automation is a necessary precondition. And you know, as you quite rightly pointed out, something as you know, apparently simple as number provision, but actually is quite complex underneath because of all the rules, all the regulations, that's got a lot of paperwork that needs to be shifted. It needs to have a trail because people can be spamming using those numbers and you know when the, the uh, sort of your, uh, finger points towards hey that's one of the numbers within your range you have to have all that documentation so <clears throat> i think that's the key initial condition you need to be automated before you start worrying about cloudify and there's a number of steps before you can you know before you move to maybe a full serverless AWS, you know, where everything's somewhere out there in the ether. We have no clue where it is. All we know is it's cheaper than we were doing before, hopefully. <laughs> Sorry Amid? for jumping in there. Amid. No, no, that's fine. Amid, anything to add yeah. that's been said so far? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I think, you know, um, it's important to remind um, people that cloudification is not really about being on AWS, Azure, and Google uh, Cloud. Um, you know, I'm definitely like from a technical point of view and from operations point of view, using, um, say, infrastructure uh, uh, cloud layers like the like software defined uh, infrastructure management. Like, for example, you could go for OpenStack, an open source alternative to building your own private cloud. You can stay compliant um, and not and, and actually build your own cloud in your in your country and still cloudify right so it's not mm -hmm. cloudification is not about aws only it's about really having that um you know a software layer that's managing all this infrastructure adding all this compute you know provisioning it on the fly etc so um from you know um in the modern world i think it's important to have that flexibility to stay competitive and the ability to scale up and down and, and do all these things and also to to benefit from like things like kubernetes and uh, containers and, and all these things because they, they they would save you a lot of money if used properly um and yeah so um now being on hyperscalers being on amazon um or or one of these hyperscaler clouds that, that's that's a choice right like that you don't have to it, it does not like if you're not on there it does not mean you cannot cloudify right you can still cloudify you can still run um because i think you know most of the solution providers these days are providing their solutions as a software not there's no hardware involved so you can 
literally you know get an up uh, open stack instance up and running managing uh, even your legacy hardware whatever you have laying down you can build your own mini aws and and utilize it to deploy uh, for example catalaya spcs or like any of these other um, spc providers or our solution or any solution out there so you can still cloudify basically without being on aws now being on aws or one of these clouds i think it's important related to um connectivity maybe latency with your major customers your major partners how close you want to be and one more thing that's critical of being on these clouds or not i think is ai right so being as close as possible to ai if you're seriously going to integrate ai into wholesale um you know being close to that supercomputer that's running the ai queries i think that could have benefits um and you can still also you know with hybrid models uh, you can keep your data in your own cloud while putting some of the other stuff in uh, AWS and Azure. I hope that answers. Um, yeah. 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 So I guess we've talked a lot of the, about the pros and the reasons to Cloudify. What are the cons? I know you've mentioned the regu regulatory complexity. Any other cons that skills. you know that come come with with Cloudification? Do you have issues? the skills in house to be able to run your own cloud? I am you know, OpenStack, I agree, it, it's relatively straightforward, but for a lot of telcos, it's been tough to hire and retain people with the skills to be able to manage, uh, you know, operate, and, you know, especially if you're using open source, the skills to be able to, you know, define and create products on there. Because part of this move, especially if you're using open source, is enabling you to take control of your roadmap, because, you know, I, to achieve some of the cost savings, you do potentially need to move from some of your legacy vendors. So if you are taking control of your roadmap, if you are building those skills to be able to run your own cloud, then naturally you want to be able to uh, control your roadmap as well so that you can define your future and truly take advantage of some of the cost savings. And there, you know, because of that challenge, that's where you have doing make versus buy. So do we, you know, sort of, uh, you know, build it ourselves, run our own wholesale cloud infrastructure, or do we look to one of the enablers, one of the partners that can run it on our behalf or, or you know, some division between that? Because again, you know, this is an evolution and we're seeing some interesting models where a carrier, a wholesale carrier might, you know, ask a partner to run for them. But then as they move up the stack and they start to, get confidence in operating that, they might then start to offer it as a service to other wholesale carriers to say, look, we've been using this partner, we're very confident, we're now operating it uh, reliably, we'll offer this as a service to other wholesale providers that can take advantage of both cloud and open source to transition from some of the legacy vendors that you know, are slow to react or have high pricing. Okay, interesting. So I guess now let's say I'm a wholesaler again. I like to put myself in the skin of a wholesaler. I think I sh I'm convinced I want to cloudify. I should be cloudifying. I meet some of the criteria you mentioned. How do I go about it? I know you mentioned automation, you mentioned skills, but let's see, Andreas, if you were a wholesaler, you know, what would you start with to be to cloudify your business successfully? Well, I think uh, I think you really need to sit down properly and, and look at the infrastructure, the infrastructure, the applications you have, right? And uh, where they're running today and where you want them to be. And which ones actually can be really cloudified or not, right? Because besides regulatory requirements and data residence and stuff like that, the, the biggest enemy is always the company itself, right? So what about security policy policies, right? And we have we have some customers, right? You cannot even log into the software installed in the data center because somebody has to walk in with a laptop with security clearance and the passport, right? So and as long as these policies exist, right, and there is no trust in public or private cloud, it's going to be always, you know, not so easy, right? So and then really define what what you can actually run in public environments or in a cloud environment and what needs to reside in your own on-prem secure data center infrastructure right and then also choose the right applications that are actually cloud defiable 
right? Because a lot of people, and that includes us ourselves as well, right? We are not fully cloudified. We are halfway there. But uh, realistically, we build software which runs on dedicated hardware, right? And then you try to put it on virtual machines, right? Uh, but virtual machines are still, you know, just allocated st stiff resources for a certain amount of compute and, and, and performance. So the next one, as uh, Amit said, right, is obviously you have to containerize the platform, you have to create microservices, right? So you don't install the whole software package all the time if a customer only needs 20% of the features, right? So, and then you can really spin off, you know, machine and instances across a, a cloud infrastructure. So you also have to look very carefully where is your vendor and how is actually their platform really cloud native, right? So, you know, for us, we just, finished our clustering infrastructure, right? So you can run multiple SPCs in 15 locations globally, but they look like one for everybody who connects to it, right? So the next step will be obviously containerization, right? So you can just, the workloads go up, you use less resources, right? Workloads go, uh, go up, no, it's the opposite. <laughs> workloads go up, you need more resources. Workload goes down, you use less resources, you pay less to your cloud infrastructure provider, right? So that's kind of the final stage. And then also, as Amit said, you need the SDN, you need the orchestration. There are your applications run, right? And, uh, and then, <laughs> as Ellen said, we have that knowledge in-house, right? And can you build that up, right? I think the biggest, the biggest, or the most important thing is to really look at your business, your applications, and look at your resources and, and knowledge base you have in-house, and then create the plan. You cannot not cloudify. That's the, that's the thing, right? It's just the way you approach it and the timeline it takes to get there. And there might be, you might still end up with some hybrid for some reasons, but uh, I think that is the most important thing to be very clear and honest about what, what you have and what you can realistically handle in, uh, in a cloud provider environment. Okay. And Kit, I mean, Andreas has, has given us the whole, the whole plan about taking notes, <laughs> but Ankit, <laughs> anything that Andreas has missed in his list of to-dos to clarify uh, no. and success? No, I guess he covered it all, but uh, I'd just like to add that, you know, there's a very interesting quote by FBI that says there are two kinds of businesses, one which are hacked and those who will be hacked. <laughs> so I guess <laughs> before businesses move to the cloud, uh, you know, they, they should draft their cybersecurity policy in place and, uh, you know, absolute, absolutely get sure of how they're going to deal with it because that's going to be a reality. Okay, very good. Very good point. A bit depressing, Ankit, but still very good. Uh, Alan, <laughs> Alan, anything to add? I'm sure you have something to add. To oh, add. you Even know if I do. You, as well. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Never disappoint, yeah. Alan. <laughs> I, I, I resonated so strongly, Ankit, where you were talking about, you know, you need a security policy. And whenever you ask security uh, about a policy or something you like to do, the answer is no. It's like, you know, with lawyers, never ask a lawyer in your organization about something you want to do. They'll answer no. So I think yeah, this comes back to you know, when I was saying people, process and technology, you know, within, you know, a lot of wholesale providers, the people come from a legacy mindset and you know in making the shift it's tough we shouldn't you know yes it's a desirable end state uh but it's a complex end state and the organization has a lot of transition and bear in mind also that you know we're talking about cloud native and the rest but you know the the big cloud providers they're moving on as well I and mean, you can see Google with its, oh, don't worry, we'll run all your messaging, whether it's B2B, A to B, just in our cloud. So what that means is it just becomes a service. You basically, you want to send SMS? Oh, just Google Cloud does it for you. So we're seeing already you know, a transition uh, in how the uh, big cloud providers view telecoms. It's just, you know, it's just a service you call within uh, their infrastructure. And of course, telcos are moving wholesale, <laughs> pun intended, into using those, uh, you know, uh, hyperscalers as they call them. So I think this is an interesting and dynamic problem. And I think from my perspective, looking at this, it's the partners that help you migrate as fast as possible to using infrastructure that lowers your costs of operations and improves your flexibility because if you don't then 
you know, you, your partners at the moment, the uh, you know hyperscalers, could very soon become your competitors. Mm. So thing, true. Yeah. The, Sorry. Go that, ahead. That, that, that's that's why we have Cattle as our technology partner. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! How much did Andreas pay you to say that, Ankit? <laughs> I want part before. of that money. <laughs> 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 but uh, you mentioned the, the transition, the shift, and being able to shift rapidly. And that brings to mind PCCW Global when they bought Console and created Console Connect. I remember Mark saying to the industry, Console Connect is not going to be incorporated in PCCW Global. It's the reverse. We're going to try to do it correctly and get all the knowledge and all the ways of, you know, the processes and ways of doing business of Console Connect to permeate throughout PCCW Global. And I think they have succeeded in, in doing that. So I think that's one way of, of, you know, partners, but also doing some acquisition that you manage properly to inseminate all of that new way of doing business. Amid, anything to, to say before we move on? Um, no, I don't have anything to add. Okay. I think the gentleman covered it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> gentleman, Andrea, that's, that's a new one for you. <laughs> Yeah. Joking. <laughs> I've been a long time. Um, so I guess I like real stories. I like real, like I said, PCW is an example. How does each of your company empower or approach wholesale cloudification? And any sh you can share any concrete examples of things you've done with customers, of your customers have done, things that have worked, not worked, things you've done yourself to, to cloudify your business and help your customer cloudify your business. Who wants to go first? Who's brave enough to go with that one first? I mean, maybe, maybe do you want to go yeah. with that one? Yeah, I can, I can start with this. So yeah, I can share a story with uh, one of our strategic partners um, and um, that we worked together on a big project to help them both um, cloudify and digitize at the same time, uh, do a, a complete digital transformation for their wholesale uh, business uh, operations and services. Uh, which is Telen, um, based in Indonesia. It's a subsidiary of Telkom Indonesia. Uh, we worked closely with them, first of all, to um, to digitize their their wholesale operations and to uh, migrate them fully to the cloud. Um, it it did not happen all in one shot to go fully cloud first. It happened in first of all, it was on prem. And then they realized that there is some parts that they wanted to go to the cloud. And we helped them also um, from, from the software side, we optimized our software to, because like Andrea said, we did not have everything ready for the cloud. You know, there's some ch technical challenges there, especially on the, uh, you know, on the voice side, on the back-to-back -back user agent side and, and, uh, and these things that where you need to change some things in your core code to, for things to run properly. So we we had to do a lot of changes on on the software side in order to 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 help them um, migrate fully to the cloud. And basically, they um, they they digitized their own wholesale services. So it, it used to take weeks to months to do uh, an interconnection with Telcom Cell. Now it literally takes minutes for any enterprise or wholesaler or anyone out there to get an um, a direct interconnection. With uh, with any of the networks that uh, Telen covers, um, and the whole process is fully digitized from signing up to signing agreement to actually provisioning the services to interconnection, the whole thing from A to Z. Um, and yeah, so that was, uh, and at the same time, they also launched a marketplace around it. So they wanted to invite also others to trade through the platform. So it's not only <coughs> digitizing them, but it also digitizes. Uh, I think around uh, approximately 400 other CSPs as well uh, uh, up to this day um, that are being also digitized and API enabled. So um, cloudification, digitization, and API enablement is all a part of it. Um, and what we're we're what we're trying to do is also, um, you know, once everyone is API enabled in terms of like things like price lists and rate changes and all these things, it makes things very very easy to. Um, to delete some of the truly unneeded um, uh, ways of traditional ways of doing business, like emailing a rate sheet and emailing, you know, some things that really should not exist anymore. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's uh, 
in brief, like there's a lot of things we learned from that. We'll we'll get into that in later on of you know what we learned from that journey. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the uh, I would say uh, a good story to tell uh, a large scale um, operation that also when we first my uh, as well migrated from the on-prem to the cloud, we also did it with zero downtime on a large scale operation running. So uh, a lot of challenges, a lot of achievements were there, uh, were done there. Um, people don't, of course, see or realize that like because things are running. But yeah, it, uh, we learned a lot from that and we'll be happy to share what we learned with the with everybody here. So what maybe before you, you we move on, what is the biggest challenge that you encountered? The one biggest challenge that maybe you weren't expecting to to meet? Um, well, there's a lot of unknowns like on on the software stack because you know our solution basically is uh, we we manage from the OS layer to the database to the triple A layer uh, to we were like a unified platform for everything. So we have a lot of a lot of moving parts and a lot of components. So some things you know are were not clear. You know what 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 would run, what would not run. You know what. Chat. So we had to basically start deploying first of all in our development labs, and uh, it was mostly I think software related challenges, but they were all like uh, doable, and we, we we successfully did them. But yeah, there was a lot of you know initially unknowns, but uh, what we learned is you know break them into pieces, do it step by step, and um, you'll eventually find a solution for any of these challenges. Okay, yeah. Andreas, what about you? Any customer ex experience or real life experience you can share? Yes, uh, certainly. Um, so, I mean, we started uh, basically running running a hosted SDC as a service, if you like, in early 2018. And, uh, and you know, when, you know, subscription and OPEX models suddenly became more interesting and appealing to service providers, right? And um, and uh, the traditional approach we took was we just uh, hosted ourselves and uh, on dedicated bare metal servers with proper IP infrastructure in Equinix type data centers. And, um, and the reason for that was that at the time, basically most telcos wanted just a replication of what they had on prem, off prem, <laughs> right? But they still wanted HA, right? redundancy, they still wanted geo diversity, they still wanted all this stuff they're used to, and also maybe want to run a patch code between the servers and the, the interconnects, right, rather than public IP. And, um, but as time evolved, right, so we, we obviously also run instances in AWS and Azure in, in public cloud, or even in customer private cloud environments, right, in their own data centers. Um, uh, it's usually very much always the same, but uh, obviously, as I said, there's always tweaks <laughs> you need to do, right? Because every cloud infrastructure has a bit of a different setup, and then uh, nothing is always as simple because, especially for voice telephony, right? You need to have the right network interface cards, so you supports all the throughput of the media and uh, the PPDK and so on, right? So and so it's not like cloud is cloud, right? So you need certain hardware preconditions to support actually uh, the software work, working properly. And um, the next step is now for us, we're all in the changing our what we call Orkey Cloud, which is basically hosted as PC service, right? We change everything to a clustered version. So as I said before, if you have three nodes from us in Singapore, Hong Kong, and in, in Miami, let's say, they all have different IP addresses, right? They look like three different SPCs. They don't look like your voice network. So with clustering, we put these three nodes in one cluster. So you have one IP address. So they look exactly the same. And if you set them in geo mode, right, if Miami goes down, Hong Kong picks up and you don't really realize it. Right? And uh, that is obviously, once containerized, <clears throat> then we can do that much better in public cloud environments as well. Uh, another thing we did, right, getting closer to the enterprises, uh, you know, we, we are the Microsoft Teams certified SPC, so to provision users on Teams and DID numbers across the PBX and SPC is quite complex, PowerShell command. So again, is is that knowledge in inside the telco? Do they have the IT people to actually do this, right? So we built a new tool called Orky Collab, right, which automates all the provisioning process, right? Having users and provisioning online. And it, uh, it's really made for service provider, right? So the service provider has the software either hosted or hosted themselves. 
and then uh, they bring on resellers or partners and then they have the enterprise layer at the end. So it really goes down the whole value chain from the carrier, the telco, all the way to the end user, right? So, and uh, there's other things we, we are looking at from a strategy point of view, but I think we have to become this enabler, right? We are the SBC, so everybody who uses our walkie call up, it never touches the SBC. It's all APIs going to the provisioning tool and you configure a kind of a very intuitive platform. And you just say, I need an SPC in US because my customer is there. I want the media to stay regional. Then you just click on the SPC, it automatically connects up. Right? So I think this is where we as software companies have to become also less, less tech yeah. uh, intensive when it comes to operating the platforms and the system. And uh, so that's where we, we put a lot of effort to actually make it easily to adopt the products and the services from, from service buyers and operators, rather than three months of training and getting used to something which is, I think, not, uh, yeah, not the times anymore for that. Okay, thank you, Andreas. What about you, Ankit? Any real life experiences you want to share either through for your classification of some of your customers' classification? So, you know, before uh, COVID lockdowns, we were running all our phone numbers operation over uh, emails and Excel files. You know, if a customer needed a, a phone number, uh, they had to uh, fill the form, sign it, stamp it, send it to us over mail. Uh, and, and then uh, we used to deliver them the number over uh, emails. So it was like that. But once the lockdowns came, uh, that was the moment that gave us an opportunity or a reason to cloudify our business. Uh, and that was the moment we realized that, uh, you know, we cannot be doing these things like this anymore. And that was when, uh, you know, we, we uh, created a proprietary platform where customers could come, see all the information associated with phone numbers and order uh, 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 anywhere, anytime, uh, all, all kinds of phone numbers, uh, whatever they need, without having a need to, uh, you know, fill up the forms or uh, ask for information every now and then. Um, the, uh, and, and recently, we have also launched uh, messaging services, uh, which is again on cloud. So we have a platform for enterprise users, whereby they can come. Uh, pay us via the credit card and, uh, you know, start to run their campaigns. So uh, I guess for us, uh, it's it's uh, cloudification uh, is the way forward. And all our services or uh, the services that we plan to launch uh, would be on the cloud. Okay. Thank you, Ankit. So I guess we're close, we're nearing the end of the panel already. It's going very fast. So I will ask you all one by one to tell the audience that watching us one one idea, one concept, one, one call to action, one challenge to be wary about. What the, is the one thing you want them to remember after this panel? So Alan, maybe you can go first. Yep. So uh, the mobile industry can learn a lot from the fixed industry, you might go, "What? We, we, this is you know, mobile. Why are you talking about fixed talent?" They are. It, I was talking to a friend at BT, and he he's been on the fixed line line side for decades, and he was saying to me, "If there's one piece of advice I could give to the mobile industry, is move away from your legacy vendors. Mm -hmm. You're not going to transform yourself unless you move away." So. I think that's a very important piece of advice from the fixed side and translating that into what we're talking here, I think it's important to look at some of the vendors here that are built on open source, that are changing the mode of operation so that as a telco, you can partner and take advantage of the solutions that they've built given the technology lead. And as you get more confidence, you can then move from into a more operation role with based on their technology. So you've got to look in the space as a wholesale provider at changing your vendors to be able to take advantage of lower price points, take your know, own your roadmap rather than being wholly dependent on a legacy vendor. I think these are key changes that every telco across the mobile industry needs to take advantage of. I think it's a great message, Alan, and the, the, the tier one and the incumbents are not very good at that. They're always nervous in, in trying new, new, more innovative vendors. I think it's a very good message. Amid, what do you want to leave the audience with as, a, as an idea or a message? 
Um, yeah, a couple of things. So one is you can um, cloudific. Don't just follow a trend. Like if cloudification is not right for you, don't you don't have to do it. Doesn't matter. Uh, if it really makes sense and you're leveraging and be having a lot of benefits from being in the in the cloud, then do it. Um, again, cloud does not mean AWS and Azure. It could be your own private cloud built with your own, uh, with open source as well. And um, like Alan said, you'll need to have the skill set, but then you'll own the roadmap of that as well. But again, you have so many choices of you know how to you know where to host your your applications, uh, or you can stay on bare metal if that's what works for you. Um, it's not always like it could sound like there's cost savings, but in some cases it's actually way more expensive than running bare metal. If you have a small, um, yeah, uh, to, to, to me by numbers, AWS is always 80% more cost than you buying your hardware and running your own. Uh, that's my calculation in every single deployment we've had. Um, it's, it's way more expensive. Um, so, but it, for some operators, it still makes sense and they're willi willing to pay the premium for the benefits they get out of it. Um, second is it's not a, it's not an, um, what do you call it? A luxury or just a nice to have, you know, um, to, like what Alan said is to own your roadmap. I think it really has to do with, uh, being relevant or not relevant in the next decade. Uh, there's a lot of changes happening. AI is, is real. AI has a lot of value. If you, your vendors are not open um, and transparent on, you know, uh, and and flexible in customizing things the way you need, or you having, you know, the ability to customize yourself by having your solution deployed um, uh, source free, I think uh, you're going to have a lot of challenges. It's important to have for every single layer from the OS all the way up to the application services to have it, uh, to have the control and the access um, over everything. Uh, politics plays a role in this. There could be a moment where this could be used by politics, where you're forbidden from using certain technologies. Therefore, own your, um, you, you need to, you need to partner with people who will give you that freedom. Um, yeah, so that's my honest message that I would like to leave everyone with you. Thank you, Amy. Very good. Andreas, what is your last message? <laughs> last message, hopefully not. But the, <laughs> um, um, it would be, well, I think cloud is certainly the way to go in whatever flavor it comes with, right? But uh, we are certainly virtualizing and making the infrastructure abstract. Right? And uh, that comes also with having the right in-house knowledge to actually operate the system. So any operator needs to become a far better IT company, right? Um, also, there are certain applications that I mean, said, right? If you have a massive peak deployment, which takes an entire server, there is no need cloudifying it because you, you can't put anything else on that server anyway. Uh, then also to, to Ellen's point, uh, I think we talked for 15 years about virtualization of software and decoupling it from any hardware which has a name on it, right? Uh, and uh, as you said, and the observation is absolutely correct, depending on the region you look at, but, uh, uh, you know, people just still buy the same entire mobile core network from the same vendor before, but just the hardware comes in a separate box than the software but it's still from the same vendor. And so you, you question you know, what, what was the point? The point was that you can actually buy software applications from the best breed of supplier who has a core competence, right? And you can mix and match it. And if you don't like one component anymore, you just swap it out rather than the entire infrastructure, right? So that has not really worked yet. You can see it in, I would say, US and European markets where there's a lot of in-house knowledge and competence amongst the engineering teams to actually qualify the, the product, right? Rather than just going to like 25 years ago, going to one guy and say, give me all the stuff, what can I do, right? So luckily there's service writers who say, well, no, this is what we do. And you vendor, can you actually support what we want to do? And if not, back in the queue, right? So, and you know, this is a, a far more customer focused approach from the service provider, right? And you can see who is who is winning, who is popping up, who is closing big deals and is successful, right? And I think the, the legacy telco, MNO and whatever need to address that silo architecture they still have. I haven't seen many changes. It's 
is talked about a lot, but uh, still many <laughs> departments <laughs> next to each other, not talking to each other. So yeah, that's my message. But um, I think yeah, it's there. But um, key thing is, as I said before, clearly look at what you have and what you actually want to cloudify, what you can cloudify, and then make sure that you actually have the people in house that can operate it. Okay, thank you. And Kit, and Kit, you have to give it a very short and sweet answer. We already over time, so they're going to tell us off if we don't close any minute now. So, and Kit, what's your last word? Um, well, I'll keep it simple, uh, and, and that's my message. So, businesses should keep it very simple, and uh, you know, uh, really uh, uh, have a, a user-friendly UI and UX uh, for their customers because uh, they don't want to build a you know spaceship where customer thinks twice of um, uh, entering and pressing a button and don't know whether uh, you know uh, that will get them the right service or take them anywhere else so uh, they should the businesses should keep it very simple and user friendly for their customers while cloudifying right a very good end of, of discussion and kit thank you very much thank you guys for an amazing discussion we could have continued talking again another 45 minutes easily so let's let's make sure we do another panel on the topic i think there's many more these topics to discuss thank you everyone thank you andreas thank you and kate have a good evening amid thank you and ellen have a good day thank you so much bye everyone thank you, thank you so much